So for the next 10 minutes, we're going to be looking together at how Romans, and specifically Pompeians, decorated the walls inside their houses. Now, I do specifically say inside, because there's plenty of decoration on the exterior walls of Roman houses, mainly political propaganda and electioneering. But today we'll be looking at the walls of dining rooms, reception rooms, and entrance halls. And forget everything you've learned in school, because I want you to shout out. So this is interactive. So if I ask a question, shout out the answer if you know it. Now, what did Romans call the buildings in which they lived? Thomas or Villa. Villa. So it's important to really understand the difference between Domus and a villa. Now, this is the Villa de Plontis, which is also called the Villa of Popea, and it's one of the biggest villas to survive. This, was, this is uh, six kilometres from Pompeii, so it was preserved in the eruption of Vesuvius, and you have to be very, very wealthy to be able to afford a villa like this. In fact, it's called the Villa of Popea, because Nero's wife, the Emperor Nero, his wife, Popea, was said to own property in the area. And because of the scale and enormity of this, this could have been her villa. And one of the most beautiful things about this villa is the wall painting. Now, um, this is called second style wall painting. And you can see how impressive it is. And it's very architectural. So this is painted into a wall and it opens up the wall. So you have to imagine that you are looking beyond to beautiful vistas with Greek temples, with porticos. And what's interesting about this uh, wall painting, this is in fact from another very, very nice villa uh, from Boscoriale, again, preserved in the eruption of Vesuvius, is it's about 100 years old, this wall painting at the time that Vesuvius erupts. So what we tend to find is that older, grander houses kept kind of heritage decoration to really show off how aristocratic their families were. And just to give you a sense of the villa of uh, Popea, this is the ground plan. So this is your swimming pool, very nice, your indoor garden, your outdoor garden, and lots of lovely rooms for dining, reception. It's really all about showing off. So the other things that we're going to look at, the things that uh, most of our wall paintings today will come from, are from a domus, which is the word for house, and specifically the Pompeian atrium house. This is a street in Pompeii, and these are the houses going off the side. This is what they tend to look like today, unfortunately, on the left. That's from the house of the Iliac Shrine, and that's inside the atrium. Now, just give you a sense of a reconstruction of what a Roman house would have looked like, an atrium house. This is the house of the tragic poet. So we come in from the front, and here's the entranceway. But what you'll notice are two closed off, two separate rooms, before you even get to the house. Now, what these are are shops or bars, and the owner of the house would rent these out to people, and people would work in them, and they would also live in them. So they were rented to people. And you would, if you were allowed in, go up the entranceway to the house and go into the atrium. And you can see a little pool here because there would be a hole in the roof and wall, rainwater would collect through. And lovely little rooms up the side of the atrium. And then this large square room here. I don't know if anyone's done the Cambridge Latin course, but that's where Caecilius used to sit in his tablinum, in his office or his study. And then behind him, you go to the private area of the house. You have to be invited into this area. And in this, you have the most opulent dining rooms. This is really where you impress people. So you have your finest decoration and mosaics. But what's interesting, the these red lines show the sight lines through the house. So even as you're walking past on the street, you get a view up the house to the most beautiful areas. So Roman houses are very cleverly planned so that you can see the best things even if you're just walking in from the street. This is one of the preserved rooms from the house of the Vettii. Now, you can see by the time that Pompeii, by the time that Vesuvius erupted, this was a fashionable style on walls. 
and you can see that the room has been, the walls have been divided into three parts. A uh, painting in the centre, usually about Greek mythology. And then again on the sides, we've got those painted vistas that open up. And the reason these survive so well is because of the fresco technique. Now, Romans did have panel paintings, such as we do, which you hang on a wall. But if a volcano goes off, they're the first things to go. But this is because of the fresco technique in which painters painted directly onto wet plaster so that when the plaster dried, the painting becomes an integral part of the wall and it survives for 2,000 years in some cases. Now, what we're going to do now is look at some of these scenes from Greek mythology from these Roman houses. And I want you to shout out if you can identify what the scenes are. Hercules, a very muscly little baby. <laughs> and Hera, because she's very jealous, has sent snakes down to kill the baby. And he's breaking through with his buff little body. But this one. Does this help? Minotaur. The Minotaur. It's Theseus. He's just killed the Minotaur. And there's some very grateful looking Athenian children around him because they don't need to be sacrificed to the Minotaur now. <laughs> Sorry? Ah, supporting, no. Look at what the hero has in his hand. It's Perseus rescuing Andromeda. And here he is at another point, and he's holding Medusa's head aloft. But notice here the detail in this. This is the Kraken. This is a sea monster devouring someone in the background. Bit trickier, maybe? Yes, this is the Judgment of Paris. So this is the, uh, one of the events which sets off the entire course of the Trojan War. So we have Hera, Aphrodite, Athena, and poor Paris is having to judge who's the most beautiful. And he doesn't look very pleased about it either. The Trojan horse brought into Troy. <laughs> And here's Cassandra, she's a prophetess who's been cursed so that she always speaks the truth but she's never believed. And she's warning the Trojans not to bring the horse. You can imagine the scale's a bit off. It'd be hard to imagine Greek, Greek soldiers hiding in there. But she's warning them not to bring the horse into Troy because she knows what will happen but she isn't believed. Now, a couple from the Ashmolean, you can go and see these in the Rome Gallery. Does anybody know what myth this shows? No. Is that Eros and Psyche? No, Psyche has butterfly wings. <laughs> I'll let you in on a secret. We don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because um, a lot of the, uh, of the wall paintings are probably localised myths. This might be a specifically Pompeian myth. And the story hasn't been written down, and it hasn't come down to us. Now, this is our only one that isn't from Pompeii. This is from the Domus Aurea in Rome. And do we know what Domus Aurea means? Nero's golden, Nero's golden Palace. So after Nero commits suicide in AD 68, we have to get rid of his memory. He was a bad emperor in the eyes of the Senate. The people probably loved him. But the Senate, we need to get rid of his memory. So his huge golden house, which took up most of Rome, people took out the best bits. They took out the statues and the gold. But fresco paintings are quite hard to remove from a wall. So what happened was that they just filled in bits of the golden house and built on top. And the Colosseum is built on top of bits of the golden house. Now, this is the story. This is a presentation of Adonis to Aphrodite. And this tree is, Af is Adonis' mother, Mira, who was cursed by the gods. But this is a very heavily restored painting. It was recovered in the 1600s and probably wasn't in great condition. 
and I will urge you to go and look at this in the Rome Gallery and concentrate on little Adonis's face because he doesn't look like a beautiful baby. He actually looks like a 19th century politician. So, <laughs> go and have a look at his face. But it's not always about um, fine, fine Greek mythology. Graffiti is a really big feature of Pompeian walls. This is from the Villa of the Mysteries, which you may know best from the beautiful Dionysiac wedding preparation scenes. But then in a sneaky little corner is this. Can anyone tell who that's meant to be? Sorry? I think we might have said it there. It's Julius Caesar. There he is. But my favourite part of this is how they've started it below. It's gone wrong and they've given up and they've started again above. And how's your Latin? What about this one? Yeah, labyrinth. Here lives the Minotaur. But this is graffiti. These are things scratched into walls. And then finally, does anyone recognize this? These are animal hunts. So these, when you went to go and see gladiators in the Roman world, in the morning there would be animal hunts with animal hunters. So this is what incredible detail has been scratched onto this wall. And this is a watercolour of the wall in which that was scratched. So someone has come along and scratched those into this beautifully decorated <laughs> top to bottom wall. So it's scenes like this that make us reevaluate how we look at graffiti, at least in a Roman context. So I'm not suggesting now that you go home and start doodling on the feature walls, for example. But we know from ancient writers that homeowners did, they complemented their walls with sometimes their own writing, their own creations, sometimes mythology, but more often than not, as we've seen, scenes from everyday Pompeian life. Thank you.